How do you preach after that? That is an absolute cracker of an introduction to our new sermon series. <clears throat> wow. It's got all of the drama, doesn't it? The, uh, the images, the intrigue, the violence, all the stuff that we're going to get our teeth into uh, over the next six or seven weeks. Someone, uh, when they first saw it during the week, thought it was a trailer for a new movie uh, coming out. Uh, it's not. It's history. It's picking up the highs and low points of what happened in 9th century BC in Israel. And it's history because what we're going to be doing in this series is we're going to be seeing that history just keeps repeating itself again and again and again. It doesn't matter whether it happened 29 centuries ago or it happened just last week. History keeps being made. And you and I, we need to learn from history. Over the coming weeks, we're going to be discovering that God really is at work shaping world history, doing it on a grand scale, but also doing it personally in our lives. Think about the history that was made just this last week or so. The Chinese stock market has been taking a monumental plunge. And then there's Greece. I don't know what you say about Greece. More seriously, in Nigeria, Boko Haram just keeps slaughtering innocents. Baghdad was bombed again. Syria is a nightmare. The report I read during the week is there are over 4 million Syrians living as refugees outside their borders since the conflict began. The Russians, they're continuing to manoeuvre in the Crimean Peninsula. And the US Supreme Court's ruled on same-sex marriage. That's just the history over the last week. Let me take you back to 2014. Watch this, a little reminder from Amnesty International about what happened in 2014. Thanks, guys. <laughs> In 2014, the world was confronted by a changing face of conflict. We documented killings, indiscriminate attacks, sexual violence, ethnic cleansing, abductions committed by state forces, but also increasingly by non-state armed groups whose rising power presents a new challenge for those who are striving to protect human rights. <laughs> Government leaders have justified horrific human rights violations by talking of the need to keep the world safe. We know that knee-jerk reactions and draconian anti-terror laws do not work. Amnesty International is accusing the Nigerian military of killing more than 600 released prisoners. Uh, we did some things that were wrong. We did a whole lot of things that were right, but we tortured some folks. Israel was doing everything to minimize Palestinian civilian casualties. The shocking indifference and complacency demonstrated by governments and key international bodies. They chose to look the other way. We want world leaders to confront the changing face of conflict. We want a real commitment and complete change in tactics. In the future, this year may come to be known as a year of historic failure for progress in human rights. Permanent ma'am. Goes on for another few minutes. Did you hear some of the, the commentary? Government leaders have justified horrific human rights violations by talking about the need to keep the world safe. Shocking indifference and complacency demonstrated by governments and key institutions, etc., etc. We could go back and pay the one from 2013 or 1915 or 1815 or 1715. Any, you pick any year here in human history, the faces would be different, the names would change, but the images would be the same. The charges against those in power that were brought would be the same which is why we can go back to the 9th century BC, back to Israel, back to the politics of the nation of Israel, of King Ahab and his nemesis, Elijah, back to the power struggle between Baal 
and the God of the Bible, the one true God, Yahweh. This isn't a fantasy story that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. This isn't Game of Thrones. This isn't the plot of a new movie. This is history. And over the next six to eight weeks, we're going to be learning about the way that God governs history, the way that his throne is the most powerful throne, and the way that when his word issues from his throne, it removes all others. And over these weeks, we're going to see Jesus And we're going to recognise that he sits on God's throne, ruling the whole of creation for the whole of time. As we start the series, why don't you pray with me? Let me lead us in prayer. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word. Help us to understand your might and power and rule and the absolute necessity that we bend the knee before you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I haven't met you before, my name's Warwick DeJersey. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my great privilege to uh, open the scriptures this morning. If you're watching uh, online, we're really glad that you're here. If you're in the overflow, thank you for coming. Uh, If this is your first time, let me again warm, uh, extend a really warm welcome to you. If you've got a Bible, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 16, and let's allow the writer to introduce us to some of the key players that we're going to be meeting over the next six to eight weeks. We're at point two on the outline. You might like to follow that uh, as we go through the morning. I'm going to read the chapter. I'm going to read the part of the chapter that we're going to be looking at this morning. And then we're going to sort of have a look at it from a few different angles and see if we can't make sense of it. We're going to pick it up at verse 29, just towards the end of chapter 16. In the 38th year of King Asa of Judah... Ahab the son of Omri began to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sons of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sagub, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Joshua, son of Nun. What I want to do with this now is I want you to imagine that we're not actually in Israel. Well, actually, we're not in the UAE. Imagine we're in Sidonia, just north of, uh, of Israel, around the time that Ahab was king. Actually, Ahab's just died. And we're watching the local Sidonian news channel. It's uh, called Al ANBC Nightly News. And they are reporting on the death of King Ahab. The news report would go a little like this. It is with great sadness that we report tonight the news of the death of Israel's king, Ahab. After 22 years of great stability with our southern neighbour, established through the strategic alliance with our own princess Jezebel and secured through the judicious diplomatic ties, our two nations have never been closer. King Ahab was a nation builder. He opened up the previously closed society of Israel to modern pluralistic ideas, shaking off the shackles of the past and embracing the alliance between our two nations. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now I want you to imagine that it's two years earlier than that. King Ahab is now alive and well, and he's celebrating the 20th anniversary of coming to the throne. He takes the same passage and allows his spin doctors to massage it a little bit. I reckon it would sound a little like this. I tried to sound like Prince Charles when I read it at nine, but I won't. It just uh, wasn't good. But imagine I'm sounding like Prince Charles, okay? Our leading story this evening is the 20th anniversary of King Ahab's ascension to the throne following the death of his father Omri after his 12-year reign. 
Our beloved King Ahab's reign has seen our nation grow and develop on the world stage. It's been characterized by innovative changes, bringing us out of the dark ages into the modern world. Ahab's strategic marriage alliance with the Sidonians in marrying Jezebel has opened up new trade markets and access to the Phoenician fleet of ships to take our goods to the world's markets. His international diplomacy, a key part of his reign, was done through key diplomatic summits that he attended. He's not only helped raise our profile to new heights on the international stage, King Ahab has been more than just the international diplomat. Domestically, he's added significantly with public buildings being added to the landscape, to the new capital city in Samaria, a city that his father Omri had built. And he's opened up our society to new ideas and, again, moved us from the narrowness of the past to help us to discover a rich, pluralistic society. King Ahab has also displayed great wisdom and foresight in strengthening our nation's defences by having Hael of Bethel rebuild the strategic border city of Jericho, turning it into the fortress that it is today, securing our southern borders. Take God out of the text and you get what you hear on the news night after night after night. Take God out and you're left with spin. Have a, look at way, have a look at the way it would have been if Yahweh had his say. Look at the red bits. Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. He was the most wicked king that Israel had known up until this point. Verse 31, if it had not been a light thing for him to walk in the sons of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, if, if Jeroboam was bad, Ahab just upped the ante and took the nation to a new low. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. He just seemed to go out of his way to do exactly the opposite of what God called him to do, which makes Ahab, I think, a poster boy for 21st century politicians. He plays politics like the leaders do today. He showed that shocking indifference and complacency to God's world. He, he justifies horrific humans, human rights abuses by talking about the need to keep his country safe. He's the kind of leader that the secular press today would lord and fawn before. They would see his public works as a great boost to the economy. His reforms would be widely praised. His embracing of his wife's faith would be a mark of tolerance and love. His alliances bringing peace with former enemies would be simply admired. But what we're going to see over and over again in the weeks that follow is that Ahab is the very picture of a modern leader. He is involved in a power struggle, not with the nations around him, not with opposition parties, but with God himself. What we're going to see is that in this world, contrary to popular opinion, there are always two thrones. And we either choose to serve under God's throne or we set up our own throne. We either serve Yahweh or we serve ourselves or we serve somebody else. Either way, we've got to make a choice. Ahab doesn't just choose the throne of Baal, Jezebel's God. He doesn't just throw down the gauntlet to Yahweh and challenge him. He throws it down and picks it up, throws it down and picks it up, and then slaps Yahweh in the face with the challenge that he makes. If there's a summary verse that sums up where Ahab is coming from, it's chapter 16, verse 30. Let me read it to you again. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. If that was this was his funeral and we were summarizing his life why, why would somebody be that wicked why do people do wicked things not just leaders anybody why do you and I drive consistently close to 20 kilometers an hour above the speed limit here in Dubai <laughs> yeah, because you know, we know we can get away with it. It's true, isn't it? When there's a power outage in a department store, why does shop theft go through the roof? 
because we know we can get away with it. Why was Abraham, Ahab more wicked? We're going to see again and again and again. It's because he thought he could get away with it. With Baal, Jezebel's God on his side, he thought that Yahweh was impotent to act. He thought he'd get away with it. Yahweh can say whatever he likes. His word carries no weight. His word has no power. There will be no consequences. I'm king and I can act with impunity. No one can touch me. You don't have to be a king of Israel to throw down the gauntlet. Adam and Eve did it when they took the fruit from the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They decided that God's word of judgment would hold no weight. You and I do it every time we decide there are going to be no consequences in our lives, whether it's from the seemingly trivial where we disregard God's word to the seemingly obviously important. Over the coming weeks, we're going to see again and again that if we take God on, if we reject his rule and his throne, there are consequences. There are always consequences. We can't challenge the throne of God and expect him not to respond. Well, let's go and actually have a look and see what Ahab actually did. The first and specific thing that the text identifies was that Ahab took the sin of Jeroboam and significantly upped the ante. But what is the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? You can't read the books of Kings without knowing what this event is because it just keeps coming up again and again and again. So let's wind back the clock 600 years and let's see if we can't work it out. Remember that the people of Israel, or the God's chosen people, ended up in Egypt for 400 years as slaves. God raised Moses up, and Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt and around to the borders of the Promised Land. Joshua followed him and led the people of Israel into the Promised Land in what's called the Conquest. Samuel he was the last judge to serve the people to rule in that way before kings began to be appointed. Saul was the first king, definitely a disaster. David, the great king, uh, who established not just the nation but brought it together and uh, established his throne in Jerusalem. He wanted to build a temple for Yahweh, but God said, no, 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 that's going to fall to Solomon, your son. Solomon although very wise, was incredibly stupid and rebelled against God. And what God said was, because of your rebellion against me, I'm going to take what was one nation, 12 tribes, and I'm going to split it in two. So in 922, civil war broke out and the one nation of Israel was split into two tribes. The northern tribe became known as Israel. It was 10 tribes in size. The southern nation became known as Judah. Jeroboam was the king of the northern tribe after the split. His sin wasn't that he was involved in the rebellion. God actually spoke to him through a prophet and said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you king of those northern ten tribes. And I'm going to bless you like I did David before you. But Jeroboam decided that he needed to secure his own throne. God's word wasn't enough. And he pushed Yahweh out. He sent him aside. And then what happened was Jeroboam was kind of worried that if the guys in the north wanted to worship God, they'd have to go back to Jerusalem, which was in the south. And he was worried that if they went south, they'd stay south, join up with the tribes in the south and come back and kill him. Look at the way he puts it in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 26. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up and offer sacrifice in the temple of the Lord of Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they'll kill me and return to Jeroboam. Hmm. Verse 28, so the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. He said to the people, you've gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods. O Israel, the gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he sent one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan, one in the north, one in the south. This, the, the, sorry, then this thing became a sin. 
For the people went as far as Dan to be before one. That's the sin of Jeroboam. For political gain, he turned the northern kingdom of Israel into idol worshippers. For political gain, he pushed the throne of Yahweh to one side and set up another throne for his people to worship. Ahab didn't just embrace Jeroboam's sin. He took it to a new level by marrying Jezebel and introducing Baal worship into the kingdom. And Jezebel, well, yeah. We're going to find out more about Jezebel in the coming weeks. Verse 31 tells us that well, she was the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, and that he went and served Baal and worshipped him, Jezebel. Let me just say, if you're pregnant at the moment, this is not a good girl's name, just between you and me. She was a nasty, nasty piece of work. Not because she was a bit of a princess, okay, but because she was an evangelist for Baal. She was the Billy Graham of the Baal world. <laughs> she didn't just turn up in Israel. She turned up in Israel with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asheram in tow. She didn't turn up in Israel ready to settle into her new country. She turned up determined to change it. Don't think for a moment that it was because Abraham, uh, sorry, what's his name, Ahab, had lousy taste in women. Mm -mm 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 -mm. He was declaring war, outright war, on Yahweh. That's all it was. Remember the way that God's word very clearly says, don't marry foreign women, that is, people outside the family of God. Deuteronomy chapter 7 says it like this. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they will turn, um, sorry, they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. That is exactly what happened with Ahab. He went to Jezebel's hometown and worshipped her gods there. And I reckon Ahab thought it wouldn't matter, that nothing would come to it that it's just modern pluralism, multiculturalism working itself out. He's being tolerant and understanding. No, no, he's just disregarding God's word completely. Look again at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you utterly. You do this, there are consequences. That marriage, that worship, they're not innocent slips. They're expressly forbidden, and the punishment is clear. Keep reading from verse 5. God gives very specific instructions about what the people were to do when they came across idolatry. You shall break down their altars, dash in pieces their pillars, chop down their ashram, burn their carved images with fire. What does Ahab do? He tries to outdo Solomon. Solomon built in Jerusalem, the temple for Yahweh. Ahab builds in his new capital, Samaria, the temple for Baal. It's verse 32. This is not a mistake. This is not a slip-up. This is a major piece of public infrastructure that would have cost him a fortune to build. This is a major centerpiece of the new city, Samaria. This is just like the Burj. It's a statement building. It tells the nation who they are. This is an announcement to the world about where Israel stands. And Ahab is unequivocally throwing his weight behind Baal. He is staking his kingdom, his reputation, his future and his life on his allegiance to Baal by rejecting Yahweh. It gets worse when you remember verse 34, which looks remarkably out of place. What does the rebuilding of Jericho have to do with any of this? Well, look at verse 34. It says, in his days, that is under Ahab's direction. No building, no major building happens in this city without the sheikh's approval, especially no major piece of defensive infrastructure. So in his days, 
Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. And it wasn't at the cost of a little bit of industrial action, problems, you know, workplace deaths. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sagub. Why did this happen? Well, it happened not as one bad luck. God spoke, and it happened just the way he said it would, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. What did Joshua say? Just after he destroyed Jericho, he said this about Jericho in Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Joshua laid an oath on them at times, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who raises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son shall he lay its foundation. At the cost of his younger son shall he set up its gates. That's exactly what God promised would happen in his word, and that's exactly what happened. You see, we're at point four on the outline. When we get to verse 34, we start to realize what the author of 1 Kings is wanting us to see. Ahab may well be throwing down the gauntlet. He may well be challenging God's authority, defying his word, but Yahweh is more than up for the challenge. And what the author wants us to see at the very beginning of this episode is that God will keep his word down to the very smallest of details. You relay that foundation in Jericho, I will take your oldest son. You rehang those doors, I will take your youngest. <coughs> it's exactly what happened. And Ahab's married a foreign wife, he's built altars, he's worshipped other gods, he's thrown in his lot with them. What does Deuteronomy 7 say will happen? It's pretty clear, isn't it? God will destroy you quickly. Just ruined the series for you, really, haven't I? That's the, we know the end of the story right at the beginning. God will keep his word to the very last detail. Baal will lose. Jezebel cannot win. Ahab will be destroyed. There is only one throne that will survive, and it will be Yahweh's. If we'd read the previous 15 chapters of 1 Kings and put this passage and, and the incidents that we're going to look at in context, we would have seen that that's actually been God's track record all the way through the book up until now. We would have seen prophet after prophet speak and say, this is going to happen to this king in this way, and then within the next chapter or so, we'd see that laid out again and again and again. Whether that prophet was a hijer, whether it was Jehu, it doesn't actually matter. 1 Kings is telling us again and again and again, when God speaks, his word rules, and it happens in detail as he promised. You see, friends, we can't take God on and expect to win. Ahab can't, you can't, and I can't. No one can. And just in case you're wondering, the answer is no. There are no exceptions. But I'm not the exception, you're not the exception, but we cannot take God on. We cannot push his rule in our lives aside, whether we're the king of a nation or whether we're a cook in a kitchen. We cannot push God aside and expect to win. He will always rise to the challenge and he will always destroy opposition. His track record proves it. He has promised to judge us and he will find us guilty if we have ruled our lives, if we've pushed him off the throne that is rightly his in our lives. So friends, God will keep his word to you as he kept it to Ahab, as he kept it to Hiel. He will keep it in its fullness right to its last detail. Let that terrifying thought hang with you for a moment and we'll come back to it. Let me introduce you to uh, Ahab's nemesis, Elijah. Come to chapter 17, verse 1. We read, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, 
As the Lord lives, the God of Israel, before whom I stand, there shall neither be dew nor rain these years except by my word. Let me introduce you, he says, to the prophet uh, uh, Elijah. This is God, chapter 17, verse 1, picking up the gauntlet that Ahab has tossed aside and throwing it back in Ahab's face. We see that when we remember one thing about Baal. Baal was the fertility god. He was the god who brought rain and sunshine and the harvest. Most pictures of Baal look like this. He's usually got a lightning bolt in one hand. Elijah comes to Ahab with a very simple word. Yahweh rules the weather, Baal doesn't. And I'm going to prove it because at my word, Baal will not be able to bring the rain anymore. You're on the wrong horse, sunshine. Verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. And he went and lived by the brook Cherith that is east of the Jordan. And verse 6, it happened just the way that God's word said it would, down to the fine detail. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. When I got to verse 7, I was doing my prep for the sermon, I was kind of a bit disappointed. After a while, the brook dried up. I kind of felt sorry for Elijah. Felt a bit like God had let him down at that point. And then I read the last clause because there was no rain in the land. And at that point, I remembered God had promised no rain. So, of course, the brook dried up. It happened exactly the way that God's word said it would right down to the finest details. You cannot take God on and expect to win. What he says to those who oppose him, he will always bring about. There's one fine detail that I want you to notice, the last one, and that is that Elijah doesn't run away. He's not a coward who goes and hides by the brook Cherith. He is the bearer of the word of God. And as God's mouthpiece to the nation, God takes him and hides him. God hid him so that he would hide his word from his people. Remember verse 2? And the word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith. God hid him away and sustained him for three and a half years out of sight. God hid his word from his people for three and a half years. Now, all the way through the Bible, one of the ways that God executes judgment on his people, those who push his throne to one side, is by removing his word from them. Hiding Elijah was God's clear statement of judgment on Ahab. It was his clear statement that he, Yahweh, ruled. And there was nothing that Baal could do about it. And just in case you're thinking this is all very Old Testament, in the New Testament it's all about love and it's wonderful, blah, 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 blah. Jesus is far more tolerant, blah, 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 blah. Look at the way that Jesus describes why he teaches in parables. He does it to judge those who listen. Chapter, Mark chapter 4, verse 10. He's just told the parable of the sower. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But to those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand. Why? lest they turn and be forgiven. Jesus spoke in parables so that people would not understand. Jesus spoke in parables so that the truth would be kept from their 
hearts and minds. He spoke in parables so that people could not turn and be forgiven. He hid the word of God from people through parables. He hid the word, as is always through the Old Testament and through the Bible, as a sign of judgment upon a nation. But what do the disciples do? They do what anybody does when they recognize that the word of God has been hidden. They knew it was important, so they asked and they saw and had the sign, the word explained, and they responded. You see, remember Jesus also said, ask and you will receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened. I want to talk to you for a moment. If you're sitting here and you have been for a while and you're thinking, oh, gee, it's been a while. We should stop and sit down. I don't even got a clue what he's talking about. He's been... If you don't get what we've been talking about today, if this is just blah, 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 ask yourself this. Has the word of God been hidden from me? Because if you don't get it, the problem is not with God's word. The problem is probably with you. A friend of mine became a Christian about five weeks ago. He's my age. He's got wife, kids, the whole shebang. Eight weeks ago, he thought everything we're talking about today was just complete rubbish. He was pretty honest and straight about it. He vehemently argued with his Christian friends. He dismissed what we said, couldn't believe that Jesus could possibly be God, couldn't believe that Jesus' death could deal with our sin at all. Then he asked God to show him. He sought God and he knocked. And three weeks ago, sorry, five weeks ago, God revealed himself to him and his whole life has been turned completely around. His life's been transformed. He couldn't see. God opened his eyes. A few days after he came to Christ, he said to me, so I thought the problem was with God. <laughs> He's so lovely. And then he had this hugest grin on his face and he said, I see the problems with me. If none of this makes sense, you need to ask, has God hidden his word from me? If others get it and you don't, if their lives are turned around by it, has God hidden his word from you? The problem's probably you. Ask, knock, seek. It's the most dangerous thing you'll ever do because it'll turn your life upside down or actually right side up. If this morning this has started to make sense for the first time and you've realised that you're on the throne rather than God being on the throne of your life, come to him and acknowledge that that's a problem. Ask him for forgiveness because he will forgive you. He will wipe away the judgment that you deserve and he will restore you so that you are holy, blameless and upright before him. I'll ask the guys to put a, a prayer up on the screen. It's pretty simple. It's for those of us who this morning have understood the word of God for the first time. We understand that we've pushed God to one side and we need to, well, we need to repent. We need to say, I'm sorry, ask for forgiveness and ask him to take over our lives. The words are really simple. Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I'm guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you and I need forgiveness. I've been running my life my own way without you. I know it, you know it. Let's be honest about it. Thank you for sending your son to die for me that I can be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. If the word of God has struck home and you get it, pray with me now. I'm going to pray line by line, give you an opportunity to speak to God in your heart. Let's pray. Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I'm guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you. I need forgiveness. 
Thank you for sending your son to die for me that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen. Let me assure you, if you've just asked God for forgiveness, he's forgiven you. He's taken up his rightful place as the Lord of your life and he will now start the renovation work and he will transform your life over the next days, weeks and months and we'd love to be part of that process with you. Please, if you've just prayed that prayer, come and see us afterwards or talk to the person who brought you. Don't leave without telling someone that you've just had the best day of your entire life and you've just come to Christ. We're going to sing uh, a new song. I'm going to ask the band to come up. It's a great song that reminds us about the promises of God and that he keeps them and that they are what sustain us. Thanks, guys.